<laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm actually supposed to be meeting another couple at 6.30. I told them we'll push it towards 6.45. <laughs> so we'll be brief and powerful tonight. All right. So uh, can somebody pray us in, though? And Nikki, I'm glad you're all done mopping your floor. I'm sure it smells wonderful. <laughs> I can pray us in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> ah, Lord God, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time just to get together, God, as women, and um, just hear what BJ has to share, what you have put on her heart, God, and it's something I pray that we can do more as a group, just get to know each other's hearts more, and really just conversate, um, especially about these things, the topics that BJ brings up, God, they always uh, bring deeper things out of my heart. And I pray that it does again today, God. It is the power of your Holy Spirit and your word. And we thank you so much for it. And thank you that BJ cares that my house is clean. I really appreciate that. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> I do, I do. It's like I can smell the fresh <laughs> scent. <laughs> yes, that bleach. <laughs> I know, nothing like it. All right, girls. Well, we can do whatever works for us. So honestly, if we want to do a lesson one week and just talk about the lesson the next week, like Nikki was just praying about, anything that works. I started this thing just for the sake of feeding into a handful of my women. And now it's just kind of, it's taken on a life of its own. So it can be whatever you girls want it to be. Okay. So be thinking about it. But like I said, time is kind of tight tonight. So I want to talk about somebody I think we're all familiar with, which is Naaman. Anybody not know the story of Naaman? It's okay if you don't. We're going to- I'll need a refresher. Okay. Tabby's like, I, I know the name. I can't remember where he is. Okay. So Lynn, if I can get you to help me read, because I, you do super well. Second Kings five is where he's located. And Lynn, if I can get you to do one through 14. Yes. I'm just changing the version of my Bible real quick. Okay. I was in NASB. It's all good. Just later. I, I don't want to read. If I'm going to read, I'm not going to read NASB. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to, to his master and told Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, said the king of the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send me someone to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariot and, and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to, to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he surely would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him, to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. Okay, so that's the story, or most of the story of Naaman. What jumps out at you? What, what, you know, what are you thinking? Just based on what we read. He was picky. He was picky. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> so 
so much so it almost got him in major trouble. But yeah, he was picky. The first thing I thought of was that he's afraid. I can't imagine being diagnosed with leprosy, but again, in those days, that was just like one of the worst things. Right. How fearful that must have been and how much his fear came out in pickiness or anger. But I just, I maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think mm -hmm. he was afraid. Okay, no, that's good. That's good, we'll talk about it. Anything else? So we see fear, we see that he's picky. I think the king's reaction is is funny too. Like, yeah. I don't know. He just gets so mad and <laughs> tears his robes, and then Elijah's like, "What are you freaking out about?" Like, <laughs> just better me. Hello. Yes, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. That's good. What was his position? This I man. was going to mention that. I was going to say it says he was a valiant soldier, and then it said, "But he had leprosy." Like it was. Uh, we can be all these things, but there might be something holding us back type situation. So, right. you know, I can be, you know, I don't know, a mother, but I was struggling with depression. It was yes. like just that one thing that was holding on to your main title, who you actually are, that was kind of keeping you behind fulfilling that role. Right. Yes, that's good. Yeah, so he carries this title. So it, it shows us that he has a title that the world looks at and go, whoa, this is Naaman. You know, we can be that. There's there's certain titles that we carry that the world stands in awe of. But along with that, however, there's something that needs a touch from God. Mm -hmm. So here's this man who's a valiant soldier. He's all of this. And they all are like, Woo, whatever we can do, send it. You know, they're willing to go out of their way mm -hmm. to make sure he's taken care of. You know, but what we have to see is that there's something powerful and special about all of us. But there's also something that needs the touch of God. So he has this problem, which is leprosy. That's kind of like a death sentence really back then, you know. He's got everything going for him. So it's almost like you have everything and nothing all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden they say, okay, we know what you can do. Why don't you go to the king? We'll send you with everything. They load him up with all sorts of goodies. Take this to the king. And then I love that Tabby mentioned this. King, what was the king's response? <laughs> we see it, I think in what, verse seven. What was the king's response? He said, I'm not God. <laughs> Why have you brought him to me? Like, what can I do? Yes. It was triggering something because he goes on. I mean, he gets pretty worked up. It's not like just, I can't help you, dude. And that's it. But he kind of goes off on a little tangent, you know, starts to tear his robe and, oh my God, and why I can't take away life? And why are you bring? It's like he starts to go off. So you look at this, you go, okay, what was triggered? I know we talked about triggers <laughs> in one of our studies before. Our responses are what they are because they're triggered by something. So something triggered a very big response from this king. So the king, he, his inability to handle the situation made him see it as an opposition. All of a sudden, it was a fight. He says, are you trying to pick a fight with me? I'm like, dude, nobody trying to pick a fight. He's trying to, he's asking for help. Something inside of him, he went into fight or flight mode. You see it like right away. You go, whoa, what was that? He went from zero to a hundred and nothing. So something triggered this in the king. So I look at that and I go, okay, he's got some, things he needs to deal with. He's got some problems. What was Elijah's um, response? Down in verse eight. Basically to your point, why did you overreact? Like, why'd you make such a big deal about it? Just send him over to me. <laughs> yes, free of all those triggers. If anything, it ignited his faith. So when the one saw it as opposition, the other one saw it as opportunity. Why is it possible that we can all be faced with the exact same thing, but see it so very differently? Because they're both faced with this one situation. One overreacts and starts to freak out. 
The other one goes, ah, just bring it to me. What makes us respond differently to situations? I guess like what we're going through at the time or maybe our past experiences. Um, and yeah, or, or maybe not our past experiences, but well, yeah, like the maturity that our past experiences has brought. Right. If you haven't been through uh -huh. Or if you're immature, then you're probably going to overreact. <laughs> right. G, were you about to say something? I was just going to say, like, our, our intimacy with God, like the king's intimacy versus Elisha, was probably very different. So when you're close with God, you're like, yeah, I can take on some stuff that normally would seem crazy to the world. Um, yeah. Yes. Good. Yes, Elisha had history with God that he could rest upon. Oh, okay, been down this road before. Oh, oh, I know who to go to. Like a lot of times you hear me say, I don't know the answer, but I know the man who does. It's like he, he had history. He had a God that he could rest upon. So he's going, why are you freaking out? Now, I probably personally can't do this, but I know the man who can. Bring the man to me. We should have that type of history with God because he's already done some incredible things in our lives. What has God done in your life over the years to prove himself capable of handling a situation when it comes up? God had done some things in Elisha's life that proved he was capable of handling it, which is why he didn't freak out. What has God done in your life as proof? that he's got this. Um, I think one of the best things God's done in my life, though he's done many things, is he let me pray about my marriage for 21 years before he really healed it. Mm. And he didn't fix things right away. And, and you know, in my 20s, I didn't get that. I wanted mm -hmm. to take care of right away. But I think that by using something that was so profoundly important to me and letting me just wait on him and letting me grow up a lot mm -hmm. and then coming up with with res resolution and restoration helped me to see him and i knew I, I think if he had solved my problems too soon i would have taken credit for it right but because he did it the way he did it let me totally see that it was him doing it okay good good so if someone then were to come and I'm, the rest of you be thinking because i'll come around to you if someone were to come to lynn come to you and go my marriage is just so it's so hard and you say well how long have you you've been praying about it i've been praying about it for two months and it's still hard would that freak you out or with that what would you do with that i would be totally okay with that i would be like you've just got to wait and see what you've got to be willing to pray for a while and see right. what because God has already shown that he can handle it. Yeah. That's what we're seeing with Eli. Is it Elisha? Is that how you say it? I always mix up Elisha and Elisha. With I Elisha, think. Elisha. Yeah. God had already shown he could handle situations. So when this came his way, he didn't freak out. So the rest of you, what has God done to prove to you that he can handle a situation? I think maybe like, let's see, I'm trying to think of how to say it, but one of my biggest fears is like death, I, but not actually dying, but everything I think will end in death, whether it's death of relationship, death of my physical being, just everything is, it comes to a finality in, in a relationship, in my health, in something is a finality of doom. And so um, I have been faced with many of the issues I think would bring about that finality or doom and I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Not to say that I won't someday, but I have been through many different types of hardships and like, right. I'm still, you know, I still enjoy life. I still enjoy people. I still want to be loving or giving. I'm not hard hearted. So I'm like, that's where I see the evidence in uh, my life from him. Cause I've seen other people go through similar situations and right. they don't have that same thing. And I'm like, I could have been there too, but God has helped me in those areas of 
fear of things that have, would happen in my relationship that already have happened in my marriage and right. we're still standing and we're still Good. together. Um, so like, that's a big evidence for me. Um, yeah. Awesome. Or that like, I got my kidney stone this summer. I didn't know it was yes, a kidney stone at the time. <laughs> we thought they didn't know what was going on. I was like, oh, I feel like I'm dying. Like I'm definitely dying. And then I got to a point where I, you know, cause I'm scared to death where I was like in the hospital with Reggie and I'm like, let's just pray. Like, I feel good about this. Like, it's my time. Like, I felt like I was faced with something unknown for death and I was able to feel okay and feel at peace with God. And so I'm like, oh, when I'm actually confronted with it, I, I trust that I will, get, I'll be there for that moment. Good. Very good. Anything, Nick? Yeah, I have a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> I think I was thinking when you first said it, when I had, I had no more love left for my husband mm -hmm. and just our marriage had just been you know in the pits for so long that I was just like there was no love and I remember really praying that God would give me more love because I, it wasn't going to come from me right and it did it really did we ended up having um our best years of marriage after that moment mm -hmm. like even more so than when we had first met as teenagers right so that was that was a big deal for me just to be able to love people more than, than I have. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I think we have to think about Tabby, look, you're ready. You, I think we have to think in terms of God allows us to go through things so that we can be an assurance to someone else coming around the bend. Naaman needed the assurance that the King couldn't have given him, but Elisha, Elisha being there was able to give him the assurance that he needed because he had been down that road before. Tabby, you look like you're ready. <laughs> well, I feel like the experience was, you know, Chris not having a job and he was the one telling me like, like when has God not shown up for you? You know, and, mm -hmm. and um, I feel like that's where I'm at. Right? Like the, he was saying, he felt like um, his experience, like exactly what you're saying. He felt like his experiences had kind of helped him to be calm and just trust God. And I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so now if that were to happen to me again, or if, if it were to happen to someone else, just like Octavia was saying, like Octavia said that her and her husband were, um, were unemployed for like two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, she, she was able to tell me like, we got through it, you know? Right. So. Yeah. Very good. Yes, I think that's so important, you know, and we'll go on into this, but who we turn to matters. You know, first he went to the king who the king did not have a relationship with God. The king didn't understand. The king was trying to see what he could handle and whatever he couldn't handle, he went into fight or flight mode and that was of no use to Naaman, you know? But then when he finally turned to someone that could actually help him, things started to settle a little bit. We'll see that as we go. Anyway, it goes from there. What happens? So he goes to Elisha and he tells him what he needs to do. What does Naaman do? He gets First. upset. Why does he get upset? He says, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and do a whole show. <laughs> yeah. I want us to talk about that. That gets us in trouble a lot. We can miss our healing because we think God should be doing something a certain way. And I circled that in my notes in verse 11 says, but Naaman became angry and stopped off. I thought, I circled that, he would certainly come out to me. Our own personal thinking <laughs> can get us in a lot of trouble because here we are the ones in need of healing, trying to tell the doctor what it is that he needs to do. We know that doesn't make sense, but it doesn't stop us from doing it. So here we have Naaman saying, surely you must know who I am. You have to at least come out. Elisha didn't even come out. He sent a messenger to the door. <laughs> I'm sure that was like a slap in the face. He's probably like, what? So all of a sudden he got his little feelings hurt, right? Got a little puffed up. And what does he decide to do? Gets his little feelings hurt. 
and he starts talking smack. What does he say? Couldn't I go to a better river, like the <laughs> best river of them all? Like, <laughs> like downplaying what river he sent him to. Yes. Because he was, his position, he probably thought, I deserve the best. I've been given the best. So I'm going to take the Ritz Carlton. Don't send me to Motel, Motel 6. 6. I don't know. I, <laughs> <I'll tell you. laughs> How is that like us? <laughs> Sometimes, not all the time. But how is that like us? No, probably more than I wanted to be, but just that feeling of entitlement. And yeah thinking that I deserve a certain standard or a certain way. Right. It can just, it's such a reflex. It's like, you're not even in thinking. It just, all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're feeling all this stuff. And, and just not even, I just lose my sense of the honor and dignity of God in those mm -hmm. moments. Mm -hmm. Begin to think I'm more than I really am. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Naaman's there. G, what are you about to say? I was just say, I could see that coming out, not loudly in, in our vacation, but they just um, wait on your hand and foot as Americans. So yeah. you start feeling like Americans should be treated a certain way when we're walking around Cabo, like we should be higher, you know? Like, so I had to remember like, yeah, they're just people too. <laughs> like what? Like they may be serving us because that's their job. They have chosen to do it that way, but they are not less than, right? So I just felt like, oh, wow, everyone that comes to that resort, just there seems to be an entitlement about being there and having people serve on you like that. Yeah. Well, we make a whole vacation out of it. I would take a vacation so people can serve me. It's in our DNA, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. Take a vacation, love it, enjoy it. But Naaman literally almost missed his miracle. He almost missed his blessing because of his entitlement, you know, and the higher you are, the easier it is to fall into it. I'm sure had he not been this great man of valor and just, you know, I don't know, regular Joe, he probably would have still felt somewhat of it, but not as much. But like somebody, I think it was G was saying, he's used to being served. He's used to people, <laughs> you know, bring, giving him the best. And you're sending me to this, what, nasty little river? Why should I go there when I can go here? So we really have to guard our hearts, you know? And when we see, when we say words like, well, I thought, well, God should have. It's like, we can start telling God how to be God. <laughs> and whether we say it out loud or not, it's in us. So we have to be careful because again, will we miss our miracle, our blessing because of our entitlement? And luckily, something happened. Did he go on and refuse to do it? What, what happens after this? First, he had an attitude. He turns away, he storms off uh, in a rage, it says. <laughs> and then his servant comes to him. And he's like, if, if he told you to do something like you expected, wouldn't yeah. you have done it? Yeah. So, like, I don't know, he, he's like, if he told you to do something super hard, you know, and, and grand, like you expected, you would have done it. But he's telling you to go wash. It's yes. super simple and easy. And you want some grand ceremony. <laughs> just go do it. Like, just go do it, it dude. <laughs> yes. Who we have in our circle matters. He had someone in his circle who was a servant to him, but so he had to have, you know, enough courage, I guess. I was going to say balls. He had to have enough courage to go up and go, <laughs> dude, come on. Wouldn't you have done this if he had asked you to do, who do you have in your circle that will confront you when you get puffed up like that? Because we Nikki. all <laughs> And I say, thank you, Nikki. Because <laughs> we all need it. We need someone in our circle, someone's in our circle, who's willing to call us out when we find ourselves on the opposite end. And like I said, we all go there. So it's not like a surprise, but it comes back to who's in my circle to help me. When I get puffed up, I don't want to miss my miracle. Who's on my side? Who's going to say, BJ, 
Uh, mm-hmm. No, Mm-mm. girl, go, come on back. Come on back. Thank God he had the servant who was willing to go. And then what happens? Does he go? Mm-hmm. He goes. Does he dip one time and get frustrated? Dip two times? What does he do? He followed. The followed. Yeah. He humbled out, followed the direction, and received his healing. That's what God is showing us. God wasn't, God didn't withhold the healing because he was puffed up. <laughs> he didn't withhold his blessing just because, you know, he stepped, he went to the left when he should have went to the right. A lot of times we think God withhold things from us. God is saying, hey, if, if I want to bless you, I'm going to bless you. Now you may need to make some changes, but I'm not going to withhold it. I'm not mad at you because mm-hmm. you got puffed up. I understand you think you somebody. It's okay. That's why I brought you your friend into your life to help you. But I love the fact that God blessed him in spite of him. God blesses us in spite of us. Amen. He just wants us to acknowledge, okay, you know, that, that wasn't cool. It's called repentance, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes we make repentance this big, heavy, oh, you know, we just, God's like, just change. Admit it, let it go, move on. And that's what we see. So we see this great man able to do it. Then what gets in our way? What could keep us from doing it? Nothing but our own pride. So he's here to show us that if he can humble out, surely we can humble out. Do you think he was sincere? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he seems open from the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to take us to the last part of this story. Usually, when we read this, this is all we people kind of stop there. You know, you got Naaman who was like, No, I'm not going to do it. Don't you know who I am? And then he goes, Okay, I'll go do it. And then he gets this healing and we kind of stop. So, Lynn, if you can pick it back up, um, where did I have you end? 14. So, 15 to 15 to um, what is it? 19. I think 19 is the end. Okay. Uh, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know there is no God in the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives who I serve, I will not accept a thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, Naaman said, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down and is leaning on my arm, I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace. What is that? What did you get out of that? What is that all about? There are some interesting things in there. He tries to pay him off or he's trying to offer him money and all that good stuff. And Elisha doesn't take it. He refuses to take it. So what did he, then he asked for something. What does he ask for? Forgiveness when he has to bow down to another God because of his job. Yeah. That's an interesting little play. We're going to come back to that. He's saying, forgive me. This is, I, I hold this position. I've got to go back to where I'm from. And I hold this position. And when I'm in this temple and they ask me about it, I have to do this. Forgive me. So his heart wasn't, this is what I want to do. But he's saying, this is what I have to do. But look at what he asked for. He asked him for something very specific, which is really interesting. Verse 17. Dirt. Dirt. He asked for dirt. What is that all about? Out of all the things he asked for, he asked for dirt. Any he put reason? Out some fires with it or something? <laughs> like are these burnt offerings still burning? Like that's the only thing that's in my leg. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see. Let me go back and find it. 
Please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any god but the Lord. So he is not from, the, from Israel. Israel was known as God's holy ground. So he's getting ready to return to this other land. So he's saying, let me take some of this holy ground with me. I would never bow down to another God. Give me as much of it as I can possibly take, as a mule can possibly take. What does that say about him, about his heart? What is he desiring? Desiring to stay. Oh, go ahead, Nikki. No, no, go ahead. Just desiring to stay changed in this place of uh, repentance, like not wanting, like knowing you have to be back or you don't want to be, but still wanting to remain changed in that place. Yeah. So yeah. obviously moved in some way. Like yes. the genuineness seems to be more there. Right. Right. Anybody else? Why jump in with my... <laughs> no, that's good stuff. Yahweh, God. Say, Israel was known as the new... It was the nation, God's nation of people, his holy place. They were the people set apart. This is his place. We now are the new nation of Israel. We've been grafted in as God's people, holy people. So he's saying wherever God's holy people are, this is where the holy ground is. So let me take some with me because I won't be here. I'm going to be somewhere. So I'm going to take it with me. We now don't have to gather up dirt because we've been grafted in as God's holy nation. We now are the holy ground, or we should be. So we would be the equivalent of the dirt that Naaman is claiming, saying, I gotta take this with me. So we have to look at it and go, my life then is holy ground. Am I living it that way? The place where I am standing is holy ground. Do I share the same reverence that a Naaman had for the dirt? for where I stand before God? Or do I flippantly just, eh, whatever, it's just my life. It's like we're so callous and so carefree sometimes that we forget that we are, and I think I mentioned this before when the other studies set apart. It's hard for us to embrace the fact that we are, according to God, holy and set apart. Why is that so difficult for us to wrap ourselves around? I think because we can go to the other extreme of it too. And we've seen that. I mean, you know, even when you say that, I was like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like he wanted to be a part of God's people in his own way. Right. Yeah. And we can just take that to a whole nother level. Like that reverence, even with our group of churches, like, it's such a great thing, but there is a time when we probably took it too far and then, you know, kind of had a bad mindset about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's kind of fear of being too reverent because one, we don't feel like we deserve it. And two, we're afraid that we'll be too big headed. And so finding that balance is so difficult. Right. Right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But yet we still are. Yeah. Even though that balance is hard to find, unless God is lying, we are indeed holy and set apart. But it's a reminder, it, the ground itself, the dirt itself wasn't holy ground. It's the fact that God had blessed the ground that made it holy and set apart. It's the fact that God has blessed us. <clears throat> and that's where going back and you pull all the little pieces of Naaman's story, God is asking us not to get puffed up not to get so enamored with who you are or whatever title you carry that you think whatever you're going through, you deserve it or you don't deserve it or, you know, people owe you. Instead, to be able to stay in a sober mindset of, 
I am holy and set apart, not because of me, but because of the blessing of this great God that has grafted me in to his holiness. But yet at the same time to love that so much, desire it so much that just like Naaman, give me as much of it as you possibly can. He didn't say, give me a handful of the dirt and I'll go about my way. What did he ask for? As much as Emil could carry, as much as he could possibly take back. As much as he can possibly take back. And I love to, I, I, Gianna already heard me share this, but last week I heard a message where the speaker referred to humans as dirt creatures. Like we're made from dirt. So <laughs> yes. it's a sense of humor to bring this all together that yes. they wanted to bring the dirt back, but it was, it's really us, the dirt creatures that are, that God sets apart. Yeah. Yes. God was, he's bringing the dirt people back. He was sending a dirt person back to the other country. <laughs> and name it, you know, we've got to embrace the beauty that God has built with this dirt, while at the same time remembering we're just dirt. Mm -hmm. It is a fine balance. But that brings us back to who you have in your life, who you have in your circle matters. We all need it. And I'm definitely not a girlfriend, girlfriend, like, ooh, girl, I got a lot of friends and that's not who I am. But I have come to understand that if you don't have someone in your circle, it's way too easy to lean in the other direction. We always need someone, someone's in our lives who's gonna be able to balance us out to remind us in a loving way that we're really just dirt. We're yeah. dirt people. I'm going to use that all the time now. <laughs> We're dirt people that have been kissed by God. So we need to embrace that and go, you know, I can't go. I've not been kissed. Oh, yeah, you have. I've been blessed by God in so many incredible ways. We all have. That's why I had everybody share one in the beginning. That was God. That was our way of saying God's already kissed us. He's already blown air into all of our lungs. So he made this dirt live so that we can stand in awe of him, not stand in awe of ourselves or the opposite of that, put ourselves down. Mm -hmm. You know, we go one extreme to the other. We go, well, I don't wanna be prideful. So I'm gonna say how horrible I am. I'm going, no, that's, that's not right either. <laughs> it's right there in the middle. So anyway, that is what God put on my heart. I really want to look at Naaman and look at the, the contribution that he brings to us. I think so often we look at him and we look at his pride and somebody, thank goodness, convinced him to go dip himself in the water and phew, that's the story. That is the story, but it also shows there's a contribution that he brings, that he shows us that once God touches you, you want to take as much as him with you as you possibly can. He knew from this point on, I'll never bow down to another God, even if the surroundings that I'm living in is different. It takes away our excuse. You know, it's kind of good to be holy when you're amongst holy people. But what if you're not? Naaman is saying, then I would take it with me. Does that make sense? Give me some feedback. What do you guys think? I really like how you made the connection. Um, Cause I was thinking about the whole dirt creature thing for a while. And the idea that the only thing that sets me apart from dirt, actual dirt is um, God's breath in me that God breathed and created a being in his own image out of the most common matter around. Um, and I think it's interesting that name it, but I liked the talk, the balance part that I, I, I am God made in God's image of dirt, but I'm still dirt and again, keeping that perspective. And that was Naaman's problem in the beginning is he forgot he was dirt. Yeah. The guy was dirt. And then, and then was humbled by the fact that, that there was a God that despite his attitude was willing to heal him. Yeah. Yeah. That's our God. 
Gotta love him. Gotta love him. All right. Anybody else? I like this one a lot just because, I mean, almost pretty much everyone on this call I've had a conversation with just either about me being stubborn or being like prideful in some way. So I'm like, oh, this is finally, I would feel like one for me to see myself <laughs> in, if that makes sense. Um, you know, sometimes I have a hard time being like, yeah, I, I kind of like that character in the Bible, but I'm just stretching it. I feel like sometimes to right. find somebody. And this one seems like very naturally to, to fit me. Um, in some ways. Right. Okay, good. Got to get us some t-shirts that says dirt creatures. <laughs> yeah, That's your I next like... book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a cup of dirt and just put it on my desk and nobody's going to understand why it's there, but I am. <laughs> it's a great reminder. Dirt creatures. Love it. All right, girls. Well, if there's nothing else, we're going to go ahead and end. Like I said, I have to be someplace by 645. But I love you guys. Have a great week. And uh, until next week, we'll see you then. All right. Thank Bye you. Guys. Bye. Yeah. Love you guys. Thanks. We're praying for love you, Tabby. You'll do great. Thank you. <laughs> see you. <ya. laughs> Bye.